I am a researcher and teacher at the universities of Amsterdam and Cambridge, and my focus is how people react to large-scale social dilemmas, whether they are related to the economy, the environment, or our political system. I use behavioral science methods such as surveys and experiments to investigate how people's cognitions and beliefs lead to certain kinds of interpersonal behaviors, and this can reveal how we influence each other and what kinds of communications are most effective. Communication skills are absolutely vital. I think we find that as the world becomes more uncertain and there is more of a battle for our attention from different uh, potential leaders or, or um, communication spaces, people need uh, to find trusted, clear messages that help them make decisions. For a long time, it was thought that simply discovering the right answer would be sufficient to lead to good policy and good individual decisions but people need guidance to help them and they need communication at every stage to achieve the best kind of outcome for themselves and the ones they care about. I think we find that in the, in the current business and political climate, influence skills are all the more important, that uh, it's not sufficient to have the technical expertise, that you need to be able to communicate horizontally and vertically within your organization and between in order to uh, understand what the key missions are and to translate those into positive impact. I'll mention two issues that I've worked on recently. One is political polarization, where the public seems to sort itself into different groups or tribes that seem increasingly difficult to come to any compromise. And the second are large-scale environmental issues such as climate change. These two topics can uh, overlap as well. And what we see is that the issues are not belonging to a single category anymore. Climate change is not just an environmental issue, and political polarization does not just affect what happens in Parliament, but drives outcomes for everyone in that society. One of the most effective uh, methods to get around political polarization is to interact with members of the other group and see them as human and worthwhile and having all of the rights and uh, responsibilities that we wish for ourselves. So this, this contact theory suggests different ways we might transcend uh, gridlock and, and communication deadlocks in, uh, in our current problems. Climate change is a fascinating example because there have been certain groups that have been aligned with a, a public message around uh, there being not enough information for action or that certain groups aren't supposed to take action. And, and we see uh, other messages in the public space, such as scientists saying there's a clear need for immediate action on specific goals. So this is a, a real opportunity for leadership and for clear communication from from our um, from allies in all sectors. The environment is a space that can seem increasingly polarized. And one of the problems is seeing environmental outcomes as specific to a certain policy agenda or a certain interest group. But instead, I think we're coming to realize that environmental issues like climate change drive other issues in the rest of society, such as uh, political functioning, economic growth, and human health. So seeing these uh, not as disconnected topics driven by interest groups, but as fundamental challenges, uh, I think is helpful to seeing uh, a hopeful path towards future transitions. Some of the complexity and unpredictability that we are facing in modern society is driven by the rapid pace of technological change. We have had a, an increasing and vast effect on the environments around us without a corresponding um, transition in our understanding of who we are and how to behave with each other. So we have this disconnect uh, arising now where where we are driving systems that we never used to be able to influence in, in uh, either in politics and economics or also in the environment, in the air, and in the seas. And that is creating new breaking points and new tipping points in society.
a tipping point is where the unspoken social rules or social consensus seem to shift suddenly. And, and there's a transition around beliefs or behaviors that can be difficult uh, to adjust to for, for businesses or, or uh, political systems. Uh, one example of such a tipping point is the rapid transition away from buying diesel, uh, diesel-based uh, cars. It seemed that sales were increasing and were going to skyrocket, and then the big scandal around emissions and VW led to a dramatic decrease in uh, diesel cars. And so the key is to see when these tipping points are coming and, uh, and be agile towards them uh, so that we uh, have the best outcome for our organizations. For thought leaders and communicators, what I would recommend is to think about what is the fundamental goal of your communication? Are you trying to persuade someone of, of a belief? Are you trying to change their behavior? Or third, are you trying to give them information to help them make an informed decision? And often I think people are, they think they're in this third category of informing, but they actually functionally are in the first category of persuading. You can tell which kind of communication you're going for by how you would measure success. If you would measure success by uh, seeing how many people were persuaded or w whether their beliefs changed, then that is the style of communication you're aiming for. One thing that's fascinating about communications that are designed to inform is that many uh, communicators and organizations, I think, have been asking themselves the wrong question. They're asking, how can I be more trusted by my audience, when they should be asking, how can I communicate in a trustworthy way? And communications that are trustworthy have the information that people need to make their decisions, and that information is presented in a fair and balanced way. Communication plays an increasingly important role in Avoca world because when people are uncertain, that is especially when they look for um, cues about how to think and cues for how to behave from their trusted leaders and their elites. So as the world is becoming chaotic and, and, uh, and volatile, the, there's an increasing need for this kind of leadership and clear communication. I think there's been a democratization of information with the rise of social media and people are less, um, less driven by a clear small set of communicators and more driven by widespread public opinion and, uh, and, and online messages. And what this means for someone who's trying to communicate is that it's an increasingly competitive space. And this returns us to the need for simple, clear messages repeated by a, a variety of people and repeated often. We've been doing two sets of, uh, two lines of research recently on social tipping points in, in activist movements. One is within the activists themselves, trying to understand what drives them to participate in, in different kinds of behaviors. And one is with public opinion through, uh, through representative public polling, and we've done that in various countries, uh, but also through online experiments where we show people different kinds of messages and then measure change it, potential changes in their beliefs or preferred policy outcomes. Lately, I think there is a particular need for communications that are designed to inform, communications that help people with whatever values or beliefs they have to arrive at a decision that maximizes the kinds of outcomes they care about. And so lately, my research has been focused on what kinds of messages in terms of their content such as the, uh, what is said, and also in their format, such as graphs, tables, or, or text, lead to people having the best understanding of the, uh, the expected harms and benefits. And I would urge other communicators to measure outcomes that lead to understanding, uh, because that is the road to people being able to make informed decisions. One example of the research we've been doing is I've worked with the What Works Centers uh, here in the UK, which are uh, diverse organizations that are aligned with the public interest. So there's one on education, there's one on crime reduction. And what they do is they look at the scientific literature and they synthesize recommendations for what kinds of policies might be the best to implement in a community, in a school, 
uh, or in, a, um, in an, a larger area. One of the things that these groups use is an online toolkit or report where they express the effectiveness of different interventions and the quality of the evidence behind those interventions. Those kinds of things are expressed with words and with icons and we test whether those words and icons lead to the understanding of the concepts that are intended. It, it's an easy step to overlook because when the experts are communicating a concept they already understand what the concept is but you need to test whether the audience also thinks of the same uh, component parts and critical definitions that allow you to have an effective communication. I see a continuing gap where communicators care a lot about their audience changing their beliefs or behaviors, but don't put the work into whether the message is properly understood. And that involves testing it in your target audience. Uh, at who has different levels of knowledge and different levels of comfort with numbers. And these numbers are critical for expressing the expected harms and benefits of different policies. One of the ways that we can facilitate a productive conversation that can lead to compromise between people who are of warring political parties or different sides, contentious sides on some public issue, is to make sure that we're communicating in language that doesn't signal uh, being uh, belonging to a certain group. And if they don't want to be part of that group, they're going to resist the initiative. So the key here is to identify uh, whether you're using language that signals certain uh, groups and, and, and be very, um, and try to use language that is in the middle ground. Or if you can't do that, use language that belongs to both groups, which is disarming. When we're thinking about being a leader in our community or even in our family or organization and, and in formal and informal settings, it's critical to always remember that your audience has their own values. And so it's much more effective to meet them with their existing goals than to try and superimpose your goals on them. So the first question to ask in any setting is, what do these people want? How do they see themselves? And how can I help them get there? And that is the judo that makes the most effective communication. As the pace of technology continues to accelerate and, and change our world in the 21st century, but we remain the same creatures, we have the same brains, we have the same social systems. We're trying to elevate ourselves, but I think we can foresee a lot of disruption and uncertainty in the, in the years ahead. When we think about not just creating effective messages, but creating an entire new narrative to help us drive positive change and be in the kind of world we want to live in, it's increasingly clear that we can't rely on the same kind of shrill messaging, here's a problem, please solve it. Uh, I know it's personally inconvenient, but you must anyway. Instead, I think there's a need for new stories that spin especially hope and, uh, and, and positive change, specific changes in communities that we would be excited to live in. So if we need to change our transportation system to accommodate a changing climate, what kinds of positive changes could you imagine in your neighborhood, in your streets, and in how children move around that you can get excited about?